Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here representing Citizens for Tax Justice, which is a coalition of uh, many groups, uh, and then you have our letterhead. We represent about 20 or 22 million people around the country. When you talk about the budget deficit here in this country, you have to talk about something that has been a very troubling economic event for us because it's coincided with a series of other economic events that have put the basic and natural, I guess, American hope that every generation is going to be better off than the one before it, not only put it on hold for the members of the current generation, most of them, but systematically undermined it for the members of the next generation, our children. The problem is that more and more we're spending and borrowing to spend rather than investing, both public and private. And we're dissipating our wealth, the wealth of our children, really, because their bills are going to be coming up for them. As you know, this administration is the first one since World War II that has been building up the national debt as a share of the gross national product. In fact, they have undone in eight years what had been achieved in the previous 20 in reducing the debt. And coinciding with that increase in debt and deficit has been a very alarming increase in inequality in this country. Income and wealth has shifted towards those who already had very much of it and shifted away from those who didn't have very much. And that is not just a coincidence. In fact, this growth in inequality and the often self-righteous unwillingness of those who have enjoyed the big increases in income to pay any taxes on their gains that underlies the deficit. Now, you're going to hear from the architects of the policies that have got us here. You heard from some of the architects today. And they're going to tell you, some of them, we don't need to do anything. We can just change the numbers in the computer or hope for more economic growth and things will be just fine. Borrow and spend works, they're going to tell you. And they did tell you. Others are going to tell you, well, look, we agree that there's a problem. Send the bill to middle and low income people. Well, we're here to tell you that either of those approaches is dead wrong and that violates the mandate of this commission. In fact, we think that addressing the problem of inequality that has developed in this country over the past decade is probably the only way you're going to be politically able and morally able to deal with the deficit problem. Now, look, we all know we don't pay for what we spend as a government. That's a truism. But the question is, do we spend too much or do we tax too little? And the people you've heard earlier today have tried to mix in Social Security in the issue and cover up what's really been happening. And I was glad to hear, Mr. Chairman, and I'm sure you're glad to say that Social Security is not our problem. And of course it isn't. Social Security right now is masking the true size of the deficit because it's running such a large surplus. It's going to continue for quite some time. If you take Social Security out of the picture, you can see rather clearly what's happening to spending and to taxes. We have a picture on page four of our testimony that probably tells the story better than I can in words. But what you see is over the last several decades, spending on all the government's programs put together, including even defense, has declined. But taxes have gone down even more. And then we see interest showing up, getting bigger and bigger as a result of the previous deficits. But taxes are down way down and that's the major source of the problem now look I'm not here to tell you that everybody's taxes went down because people wouldn't believe me in fact quite the opposite most people's taxes have gone up over the last decade you've all read the studies not just from CBO but from the Joint Committee on Taxation from the Treasury Department everyone agrees that for about 95 out of 100 Americans taxes have gone up as a share of their income over the past decade but for that five percent at the very top Taxes have gone down, and they've gone down a lot. In fact, for the top 1%, they've gone down by about 25%, or about 44000 and change apiece, more than most people earn. Now, that's coincided, as I said, with a sharp increase in the income of the very wealthy and a decline or stagnation of the income of middle and low-income people. So you have a situation where more and more of the income is shifted to the upper end, and they're not paying any taxes on it. That's a recipe for a fiscal disaster, and that's what we face. Now, sometimes people say, they've read too many Peter Grace ads, and they say, well, what difference does the top one or the top 5% make? There are only a few people. We're only talking a million or five million people. How can that be the cause of the deficit? Well, it's important to keep in mind that this year, the richest 1% will make more than the bottom 40%. And the top fifth of us, and probably us is the right word, will make more than everyone else all put together. So if you're going to go after the deficit problem and the revenue problem, you have to go where the money is. And the money and the tax cuts 
have been at the very top of the income spectrum. So what are we supposed to do about it? You'll have people come in who'll say, look, all right, if you really force me to say it, taxes are better than borrowing. But we have to have a kind of a tax that'll stifle consumption because that'll be good for investment. Well, look, I agree with them that our goal here is to increase investment, to shift our priorities away from current consumption. But that's not the point. Any tax increase you pass will, will have the effect of leading to increased investment, assuming you work it out with Alan Greenspan on interest rates. And some budget cuts will have that effect if they're not cuts in infrastructure spending or, or science. The question is, whose consumption do we want to cut? You know, we tried this experiment really for more than the last 10 years where we said if we give people incentives to save and incentives to invest for corporations, it will lead to more of those things. And we saw what happened. The fancy tax lawyers got their acts together. They converted it all into tax shelters. The corporations worked it out and they converted it all into higher executive pay and bigger dividends. And then they started to buy each other in this uh, almost orgy of corporate mergers we're into now. And it didn't lead to more investment. We've got less. What it led to was more consumption by the people that got the tax cuts. So that's the question you've got. What do we want to do? We want to make it harder for these top group to buy another Mercedes? Or do we want to make it impossible for people to buy, Mr. Iacocca, we're here, a Dodge or a Plymouth? That's what the issue is. The people that are pushing these regressive consumption taxes have one thing in mind. They want to cut consumption by middle and low income people who have already fallen behind. The kinds of changes we suggest here, and we have them here in detail on the income tax side, are directed at one goal. We want to shift consumption away from the conspicuous consumption of the rich and towards the private and public Ross, investment you're that we need. Awful lot of your thank colleagues you. times and I, uh, I don't want to rush you. I was finishing. I thank you. What way is there to lock in to guarantee that a tax increase would truly go for what we all say it ought to go for, for deficit reduction? How do we guarantee it? Mr. McIntyre, can we? Well, you, obviously, you can't guarantee it, but you, if you look at the record over the 80s, uh, Congress uh, has been as concerned about the deficit as anyone else in America, and they have tried to do something about it. They have had impasses with the White House uh, occasionally, like, like in 1987, but uh, for instance, the 1982 bill, which is still raising about $50 billion a year as an offset to 81, is going to reduce the deficit. We are in a, a downward uh, spiral on spending uh, other than interest, and uh, that will, I'm, I'm sure, continue, and that Congress is as desperate to deal with the deficit problem as anyone in this room. In other words, all the revenue growth, almost all the revenue growth that's expected this year, is already eaten up with, with spending that has not been restrained. That's exactly right. Exactly wrong. Is that wrong? No, that's I mean, look, exactly right. Most of the spending increase that you're seeing there is just to deal with inflation. Now, if you think you want that people should get real cuts in their Social Security, or we should cut defense in real terms, or we should roll back environmental protection, I mean, that's a, that's a position that I think uh, ought to be debated. But mm -hmm. if we're trying to look at, at buying what we ah, buy which, now... So you're, what you're the, saying is if inflation is higher than 3%... The current services budget uh, says let's make sure that the... We keep up with inflation and that if there's more old people next year than there are the year before, that we, they get their Social Security benefits. That's all. It's not uh, that we're all of a sudden going to buy a new tank that we hadn't uh, uh, budgeted for before. It's the old budget just keeping up with it. Well, in answer to your question on the defense budget, it is down in real terms the last three years. The defense has certainly been put on a downward glide path. Our problem with it now is that unless we find a way to uh, deal with all the built-in uh, increases that are coming up from behind, uh, they're going to have to cut Real back on readiness, and we all know that. Yeah. Well, thank you, gentlemen.